Hey booktube, it's Jackie. How's it going? If you're new to me, it's the first time you're seeing my face. Hello, what's up? My name's Jackie. I sit on my floor and I talk about books. So I hope that's why you're here because that's what's going to be happening today. If you are not new to me, thank you for tuning in the continued support. I really do appreciate it. So today for you, I have my weekly wrap up. This is from July 24th to July 30th and all my reading shenanigans in between. So without further ado, grab yourself a drink, have yourself a seat and let's get talking some books. All right. So this week, before I get into talking about the books, I completed this week. I need to preface this whole video in saying that this week was a very emotional reading week for me. My emotions were across the fucking gambit. Okay. Oh my God. It was a roller coaster emotion. It wasn't just because I was PMSing most of the week. All right. Had nothing to do with that. Just, oh, so many emotions were going through me with all the books that I was reading. It was fantastic and scary all at the same fucking time. So let's just dive right in. Now I got my preface out, my preface out of there. Let's just, let's just go. The first book I completed was The Revenant, a uh, novel of revenge by Michael Punk. This was a carryover from the week prior and I was listening to this on audio. This audio book was narrated by Holter Graham, who was excellent. He, the voices he used for the characters, fantastic. I had a great experience with the, with the audio book. I felt still very engaged even while doing other things. Um, and I actually didn't want to do other things. That's how captivating the audiobook was. I didn't want to actually physically do other things while listening to it. His, the way he told the story and this overarching tone that he kept giving throughout the story. And I don't even know what that tone was. I, I don't want to say it's despair. I don't want to say it's hope. I don't want to say it's revenge, but a real, really fucked up combination of all three of them. Like Holter Graham just did a fan fucking tastic job with narrating this book. Now, if you are not familiar with this, this was turned into a live action film a few years ago that won the Academy Award for Best Picture. No, not Best Picture, uh, Best Actor. Leonardo DiCaprio won it for Best Actor. And I fell in love with the movie then. And that's actually why I picked up the book was originally because I wanted to read the book because I liked the movie so much. The book is so much better than the movie, but in different ways. The movie is excellent and better than the book in many different ways. So they are equal footing, depending on which category you are looking at in comparison to each other. This is the story of Hugh Glass. Hugh Glass was an American frontiersman, fur trader. He worked for the Rocky Mountain Fur Trading Company and he was attacked and mauled by a, a mother bear protecting her cubs and he was had gashes down his back, across his neck. He was pretty much dead. He was, for all intents and purposes, anybody there would have assumed he was dead. Anybody now would probably assume that he was dead. Um, but he survived and this is his story. So this book shows animal mauling and animal death. It has survivalist techniques that I think actually might work. Um, some of them are so crazy and out there that, you know what? I would not be one bit surprised if that didn't fucking work. And it also emphasizes highly on revenge. This is literally the title. It says a novel of revenge. This whole man's drive to survive was to complete this revenge that was hoisted upon him after this vicious bear mauling. You see, when he was mauled by the bear, his captain of his fur trading company, when they found him, they stitched up the wounds that he could and they were going to bring him back to the outpost. So essentially he could die with some dignity. Well, they reached a part where they couldn't cross a river while carrying him because he was prone. He was, he was completely useless. He could not do anything. So the captain of the company is faced with this moralistic decision. Do I sacrifice one for the sake of the many or do I sacrifice the many for the sake of the one because my own moral character? He chooses to sacrifice one for the many, a very utilitarian approach, which, you know, that in and of itself definitely lent to this emotional roller coaster I went on this past week for reading. Um, it just helped lend to it because I, I, if I was the captain, I don't know what I would choose. I have no idea. I, I, I would never want to be in that guy's shoes. Would not want to be in his shoes at all. But needless to say, he um, decides to sacrifice Hugh Glass, but he leaves two people who were volunteers to stay behind and essentially bury him when he dies. Well, 
those two, Fitzgerald and Brigger, those are Bridges, Bridger, Brigger, <laughs> Bridges and Fitzgerald, the two members of the fur company um, that choose to stay, they have different things in plan um, or in mind. Bridges is a young kid. He stays more out of loyalty to Glass. Fitzgerald doesn't like Glass, hates his guts. And people think this is strange that why would he be staying here? Well, they're going to get paid. And that's why he flat out says, he's like, I'm staying for the money, guys. I'm staying for the money. And they don't think he's going to survive long. I mean, when I say that this man is literally walking dead, he is on borrowed fucking time. He's got a gash in his neck. He's got gashes down his back. His leg is broken. Like, we're not talking like a break. I'm talking like this thing is fucking shattered. He has to drag it along. He is fuck seven ways till Sunday, not in a good way, okay? So they don't think it's going to be a very long time before he finally succumbs to his injuries. Well, before they find out exactly how much time it is, a raiding party of um, Indians come around. And at this time, Indians and the Frontiers people, they were not... They were not on good terms. This is the time period where they were scared of each other for different reasons. And so any con any any meetings usually ended in bloodshed. And um, so Fitzgerald and Bridges save their own asses. But before they do, instead of just choosing to save their own asses and leaving Glass to fend for himself, they take everything from him. They take his gun, they take his weapons, they take his ammunition, they take his pack, um, they take everything, leaving him with literally just like this little bitty razor blade that was happened to be on him at the time. They essentially take away any defense he might have possibly had to maybe prolong his life a little bit. And they flee. And then for some, somehow, somehow glass, either it is divine intervention or he is the luckiest son of a bitch on the place of the fucking planet he survives he survives multiple multiple near-death experiences along this journey and this is where our story really sets off and it is intense it is scary it is it's insane this is an insane story of survivalists of facing elements of your own drive as a person what people can overcome when faced with adversity I mean it was so fucking good it was great I thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed this book immensely um and it's just even if you reading this book for some of the survivalist techniques some of these things were crazy he built a boat out of bones built a boat out of bones now, my, he, minus he had trucked across, you know, after he'd healed a little bit during his fight for survival. But yeah, built a boat out of bones. I was just, when I heard that, I was like, hold on, I'll re-listen to that again for a second. What? Like, some of the things that he does to survive are just in freaking sane. I thought they were insane in the movie. No. The movie doesn't even touch on half the shit he did in this book. I mean, it was crazy. Um, what worked in this book? The descriptions of the environment. This book is so visually stunning and you don't even see it. Just the way Punk has described the wilderness and the forests and the cold and the plains, just everything. It is visually a stunning book in your head. If you have any bit of imagination, this thing is stunning. And the movie was stunning as well. But the book just, oh, it was beautiful. I just, I got lost in some of his descriptions of the world that we were in, in the Frontiers days. I was just, mm, it looked beautiful. It made me want to go outside. These environments made me want to go into the woods. Maybe you want to go walk around the lakes and the rivers and actually want to be outside, which by the way, is not something I like to do very often. I'm kind of an indoors girl. So it, it put this feeling in me where I wanted to try something new and go explore. It was just fantastic. The detail and the survival techniques, you can tell Punk really did his research with these because he described them and why they worked. He didn't just tell you what he did. He gave you explicit descriptions. So essentially, if you've ever gotten this position, maybe you could actually do this and survive. Like, 
it was insane. There were times where I felt like I was listening to like a Boy Scout manual, but it was still really cool because I found it really, really interesting. I've actually recommended this book to a couple of um, my friends that are very much into survivalist wilderness techniques. They're big campers, they're big hunters, and I recommend to read this book just so they said that they read it because I think they would all really, really enjoy it. And the last thing that worked in this book was this feeling that it created about never giving up. I mean, this guy went through so much shit. I mean, one thing after another, a rattlesnake, wolves, eating rotten bone marrow, finding his own food, surviving on just base vegetation, building a boat out of bones, running away from rival Indian groups that wanted to, you know, destroy his body even more than already was, maggots eating at his back, Oh God, that, that scene nearly got me. But it was just this, this tone. And I don't know if this was conveyed more by the narrator or by the writer. I can't really say for spef specifically which, who really conveyed this feeling, but it was just this idea of never giving up and never walking away. And it was just so fucking great with all this emotional roller coaster that was going on this week. This book definitely helped going, convey the emotion, never give up never give up be the train that keep you know the little engine that could you know just keep going just keep going just keep going and that's what this book was it was it was phenomenal um what didn't work there was some areas in this book that didn't work uh the historical liberties taken it was still very good but there were historical liberties taken um we don't exactly know everything that hugh glass encountered um during his truck for survival nor when he finally made it to the camp um and if he ever really got his true revenge the uh we don't really know it was never documented what the ending of his story the ending of the story is never really documented so the historical liberties that were taken were ones that i really wish i they were taken because the actual knowledge wasn't there and that's why they were taken because they needed an ending to the story. But I really wish that maybe the author would have just acknowledged that and said, you know, hey, we, we don't really know what happens. We don't have an ending for the two men. So yeah, that, that was kind of a letdown, but that was more me doing my own outside research on the book after I finished it. So that was the reason that ended up not working for me. Um, and the fact that there, there was no real actual revenge. I mean, these guys abandoned him, left him for dead, took his only means of survival. And there's no actual revenge. This, this drive of revenge that just drove him throughout this book. And then finally he gets a moment to do it and it's not taken. But at the same time, I mean, he just survived the wilderness after a bear attack that left him crawling 300 miles on a leg. And I'm not talking like the broken, I'm talking the smashed, obliterated leg that he dragged 300 miles. I'm like, are you fucking serious? Y your revenge is the fact that you fucking survived and you did nice, did nice big fuck you to those guys, you know? That's what, that was the revenge. You didn't really actually kill the guys, I guess, but it still kind of gnawed at me, so yeah. But that is The Revenant by Michael Punk. I definitely do not regret reading this. And this was on my self-destruct list before, um, read, read before self-destructing. And I am not going to self-destruct this. I'm definitely keeping this one. This one's definitely going in the collection because this thing is fucking awesome. Highly recommend this, especially if you are outdoorsy, you like the wilderness, you like survivalist books. Yeah, definitely, definitely a good one. All right. The next book I completed was Faking It by Kay Bromberg. And it looks like this. This was great. This was a nice audiobook to um, kind of uplift my emotional roller coaster that it was this week. Um, it is a standalone, and I did listen to the audio. The narrators are Aaron Malone and Rupert Channing. And this is a hate to love, enemies to lovers romance with a forced proximity forced proximity trope involved. And this story had a really cool thing that they did. The author 
did a fourth wall style telling the story. And if you are if you are familiar with a fourth wall is, that is the idea that comic book characters realize that they're actually like comic book characters and they're talking to the people that are reading the story. So the characters realize this was a story and they're talking to you. So that was really cool um, how it how it jumped back and forth through that point of view. So not only did we get the point of view of the male hero and the female heroine, we also got their point of views talking directly to us of about what the story was about. And I really really enjoyed that concept. Thought it was great. Um, this is about Zane and Harlow. Harlow is a model down on her luck. She's just not getting her big break. And Zane is an entrepreneur on the verge of a new life changing deal. Now they meet under a mistaken identity circumstances. Uh, Zane believes Harlow is his dog walker and just hands him his dog his dog and says, go walk him. And Harlow's like, are you serious? I'm not doing this. But because she loves animals, she takes him, but she just takes him back to the office. And because of this, she misses her appointment for a job that she really, really needed. And then they encounter each other again because Harlow didn't actually walk said dog, just took him back to the office. And Zane follows her and basically says, you're fired. You're horrible at this. And she's like, well, I'm not even your fucking dog walker. So cue in your firing. And then they get in this banter which just sets off this story. Um, Zane does feel a little bit of bad about me at seeing her, uh, having, making her miss her interview. So he reaches out an olive branch to her, invites her to this party. Maybe she can make some contacts and some deals. And then, well, Harlow decides to take advantage of opportunities that I put in front of her. And by her taking advantage of the opportunities and Zane trying to one up her instead of just calling out their bluff, they are now forced to work together. And that's where our story really hardcore takes off with this hate to love, enemies to lovers thing. And this thing was fucking fantastic. I gave this a 3.5 on the chili scale, um, chili pepper scale. Sex scenes were great. There was great tension prior to that very first scene. Oh, that buildup. Mm. That was fan freaking tastic. Get a little victory dance on that one. That buildup was hot as Oh my God, it was great. That first sex scene, mm, I was so glad I was sitting in my car for that one. Yeah, that was great. That was fantastic. That was well, well earned. That was a well earned one. Oh yeah, that was great. And uh, it coined a new favorite phrase of mine, uh, FTD, fingers, tongue, and dick. Yes, that, that's gonna be a thing now. <laughs> I don't know when I'm gonna use it, but that's a thing now. <laughs> You have great FTD. So yeah, that, that's great. And um, this book also, their sex scenes displayed a very refreshing version of realness. Um, sex is not always smooth. Like when we read these romance books, sometimes it, it seems very smooth, very fluid. Yeah, there's there's tension and, and you know, bickering. But in real sex, there are mess ups. People don't know where to put legs, don't want to put arms, like, blustering, pulling off condoms, trying to put them on. And Kay Bromberg put that in this book with these sex scenes, these, these little weird mishaps that happen between people in real life. And that was so refreshing to see. I loved it. It made me feel like I could relate to this story a hell of a lot more. I could relate to um, Harlow during that messed up condom scene. I just thought it was hilarious. I was like, yeah, that's great. And you know what? The fact that she's showing people, adults being responsible and using protection, Kudos. Good for you. Um, that was great. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Sex scenes were great. Just all in all, sex scenes were really, really good with this book. Really, really enjoyed it. Um, what worked in this book, the banter between these two characters was fantastic. I could not have asked for better banter. The These two, just the back and forth. Harlow was just right on it every single fucking time. And Zane was just like this cocky SOB. And he's like, yeah, but she loved me anyway. I'm like, oh my God, I hate when you do that. Oh, I hate when guys do that, but it's so hot at the same time. So it was great. I, I thoroughly enjoyed their banter back and forth, back and forth. Um, they had a really believable transition to from hate to love. This is a enemies to lovers, hate to love story. And it was a believable transition. It wasn't just like one day I hate you, the next day I love you. It, it was a very, very smooth, almost, you don't even see the transition even happen. It was so smooth. And at the very end, it's it's not even 100% solidified. It's acknowledged that 
eight weeks ago, I fucking hated your guts. But now, I want to be better. I, I want, you, you matter to me, but I, I still have reservations about it. And it, the acknowledgement of that love is not something that is so easily found and so easily discovered. It is built over time, over things. And the acknowledgement of that with a, hate to, with a hate to love story, I thought was really, really nice. I really enjoyed that aspect to this as well. Uh, the fourth wall telling, great. I loved when they started talking to me as the reader. That was awesome. It took a little getting used to because I wasn't expecting it. But once I figured out what was going on, I was like, oh, that's great. Zane's going to talk to me now. That's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, great. <laughs> and the constantly one-upping of each other, that which goes back to their banter. I mean, they just had to one-up each other every single time. And it was just, it was great. It was nice refreshing because I see couples do that all the time. They seemed like a real couple. And I thought that was great. I love that. What didn't work in this book? Um, there was a lot of obvious events. A lot of it was obvious kind of how the story was going to play out. Um, there wasn't a really a lot of twists. There wasn't a lot of surprise elements. And what was surprising, it was kind of obvious that it was going to be there. Um, but I say that because of this reason. When you read a lot of romance books, people who read hundreds or thousands or have only read romance books, you start to see a pattern in a lot of romance books. So for one to really stick out and be like, that was completely unexpected, that's a big deal for a seasoned, I want to say seasoned romance reader, but for a novice romance reader, things aren't always as obvious. And I'm not saying I'm a seasoned one. I don't even think, but I don't think I'm a novice either, but I don't think I'm intermediate. I'm kind of in between the novice and the, the mid range. I want to say like I'm there. I don't intermediate. I guess I would say intermediate because immediate middle middle. I don't, I don't know. I don't know exactly category, but I'm not up here, but I'm not down here. I'm kind of like right here. And I thought there were parts that were obvious. So for a seasoned romance reader, I think they would believe this book to be completely flat. You know, it's, yeah, this is going to happen. That's going to happen. Oh, saw that one. Oh, figure that one out. It It's going to be very mechanical for a very seasoned one to read. But for somebody who's not very seasoned, I think it'd be a great experience to read this book. So that was my only holdup with this book is that for the degree of romance of reader that you are will define how much I think you will really enjoy this book and the sequence of events and the fallout of the story. So... Yeah, but I give it a four star because I am not super seasoned and I thought it was great and I love the banter. The banter was really what set me off. I really enjoyed that and the fact that they showed the realness of the sex scenes. Like that, man, it, it wasn't crazy ass fucking positions. It was awkward. They didn't put legs. It was, it was real and it was great and I liked it, but it was still hot and sexy at the same time. So it was, I, I enjoyed it. Had a good time with it. Um... And I think even seasoned romance readers would still appreciate some elements in this book. So now the next book I have, um, I have not finished, but it's because it is Dragonfly and Amber by Diana Gabaldon. I'm still working my way through it. I actually had to put it down so I could read the next book. So that's why it's not finished, but I am still having a great time with it. I plan on continuing with it. This thing is still five stars. Still it is. But this thing definitely puts me on an emotional roller coaster, which did not lend well to this week at all either. Because if you've read this book, you know what happens in this book. And it's just, oh my God, some of those scenes. I forgot how heartbreaking they were for Claire and Jamie. And, but I still love their, I still love their relationship. The relationship is still one of my faves. I, I just love it so much. Um, yes, this is still fantastic in my book. Still very, very, still good. But still working on it, so. Um, I did start Tall, Dark, and Lonely by R.L. Mathewson. I am only about 10% into it, so I don't really have anything to say about it other than that I have started it. And it is an audiobook that is being narrated by Stella Bloom, and it's the first installment to the Pite and Sentinel series. And right now, I have no idea what's going on. Like, the first 10%, I have no idea what's going on. Um, I'm still trying to grasp the world. I'm trying to grasp the rules of the world. Um, I do believe it has something to do with vampires, but they haven't, actually haven't called them vampires yet. So I don't know exactly what they're calling them. Um, and they have some di very different ways than traditional vampires. So that's why I don't want to call it a vampire because there are vampiric elements, but there's a lot of elements that are not 
vampiric at all. I don't know what they are. I haven't figured that out yet. So um, my opinion on this is still to be determined, but I'm still gonna plan on continuing with it um, and figuring out where it goes. And the last book that I completed this week is this, Court of Mist and Fury by Sarah J. Mass. Um, I don't know what to say about this book. I, 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 um, I love and hate this book all at the same time. Um, I'm going to be perfectly 100% honest with you guys. I technically finished this on, uh, July 31st, which is the day that I'm filming this video. I actually finished it about two hours before filming this video. So I am still coming off of finishing this book and, um, This book is five stars. Um, I'm reading it for the Sarah J. Mass read along, Mass Jam along, and uh, I have I have read some great books in my life. I have read stunning books, timeless books in my life, but I have never, except for Outlander, read a book that I immediately didn't have an opinion after as soon as I finished it. I mean, I have opinions, but they're all over the place. I, I, I don't know where to stand on this book. I didn't know where to stand when I read Outlander. These are the only two books in my life that ever made me feel lost. And this book is probably worse. I don't know what to do right now, except I, I, I want to smile because of what I experienced in this book. I, I want to scream because of what I saw in this book. I want to cry because of what was broken in this book. I, I am shaking. This book physically affected me. Not just emotionally, it physically affected me. But I would do it all again in a fucking heartbeat. I would go through all of that again. Every second of it. This thing was great. It was great for really dark reasons. It was great for really good reasons. And I cannot wait to find out the rest of the story. This book. I have been saying every time I read a Sarah J Mass book that she is solidifying herself as one of my favorite authors. Every time I read a book. This book is fucking sealed it. This woman in the last hundred pages of this fucking book took me from here to here, back up to here, and then to here, and then fucking turn me out, turn me around, and said, "Have a nice fucking day. I'll see you in the next installment." An author who can run my entire gambit of emotions in that short of a time span, and at the same time physically have her book physically invade my mind and my body and everything about myself. This thing. This thing's fantastic. This is fucking great. It is amazing. It is painful. And I would do it all over again. And I cannot wait to the live show to talk about this with my girlfriends because damn. And I will link that live show once it goes up back to this video so you guys can watch it if you miss it. It is this Sunday, July 31st at 7 p.m. It'll be hosted on Jen's channel over the Book Refuge. So please go check it out and you will get to see my full reactions for this. And I filmed a vlog of me reading this book, my very first vlog. So 
with the act of God and a lot of patience and time, I will have that up very soon so you can see exactly what the fuck I'm talking about and why I really can't say much else about this book right now. So that is what I have for you guys today. That was my weekly wrap up. Um, I will see you guys all soon with my monthly wrap up because July is over people. Holy shit. July is over. All right. That's what I got for you guys today. I will see you guys all soon with another video. Go check out the live show. Um, it'll be July 31st at 7 PM, which is today. And I will see you guys all soon with another day with another, with another video. So, bye guys.